Um, great talks. Uh, Mark, a question for you. Um, where will the people park their cars when their block is turned into a super block? Um, can you hear me? So actually, <coughs> the idea for the super block is to cut off the junction for through traffic. They still can go with their car into the super block and park them if you live there. But it's a particular to get the through traffic out. Now, in Barcelona, a lot of the cars are parked under the buildings, um, so there is still space. But I mean, hopefully, what we're hoping for as well, that people leave their car or sell their car and get rid of their car. You know, to be honest, I mean, I don't have a car. You don't need one in Barcelona. It's only if you have to go outside Barcelona, you need a car. But I think the whole thing with cars, anyway, it will change fairly quickly with the new technologies uh, coming on board, autonomous vehicles and uh, et cetera, that I think uh, will it make it more that people won't own a car anymore in the future, but uh, have it used during the day the whole time without being parked. Um, yes, good, it's on. Hi. Thank you all for an amazing series of presentations. One of the things that I found really striking um, was the social isolation being really high in both rural places and urban places, as well as kind of the two varying very high air pollution in both of those settings, but of different types. And I was hoping maybe everybody, I know it's not, <laughs> um, those specific examples don't cross everybody's talks, um, could talk a little bit about ways that we can partner rural and urban issues to come up with innovative solutions that might um, work in both contexts. Um, yeah, I can go first. I think that's a great question. I don't know that I have a short or easy answer for it. I think um, places are different, and so it, the, there's not going to be one solution that's going to work in all combinations of rural and urban areas. But I think conversations like this are a starting point where we're not just doing urban areas or just rural, but talking about some shared resources and also seeing um, the symbiotic relationship that I mentioned earlier, where I think particularly in urban areas, it's easy to sort of forget about rural areas. Rural areas are much less likely to be able to forget about the large cities that are near them. Um, so I think remembering that we are all part of the same problems and we need to be part of the same solutions is um, important, sort of aspirational. Yeah, in terms of air pollution, I mean, I, the everywhere is linked and I think the kind of, I don't know how you describe the region from <coughs> DC up to Boston, um, the greater northeast. Um, air pollution, when you have a, an air pollution action day in DC, you have one all the way up the East Coast, and, and, and it's, it's a regional linkage. And so not only the cities, but the areas in between are, are suffering from, from air pollution problems. This typically happens in the summertime when you don't get a lot of airflow, you get things to kind of stagnate over that region, and you that, that whole airshed tends to have problems. And yes, it is, is typically worse in cities because that's where a lot of the emissions occur. But ozone, for example, forms chemically in the atmosphere, and that's another one of those air pollutants that I didn't touch on today. But that happens predominantly downwind of cities. The highest air the highest ozone levels in Philadelphia are at the Northeast Airport, which is the northeastern part of the city. It's not the city center. It's it's downwind. It takes time for that chemistry to happen and those air pollution levels to build up. So they're intricately linked. And any policies that we have that reduce urban air pollution are also going to benefit the rural areas downwind. Um, I spent a lot of time with uh, multi-stakeholder groups called food policy councils around the country, and some of those groups include rural producers, and we see a lot of collaboration happening where there has to be a fair amount of education and sharing of challenges and opportunities before they get to that place where they trust each other to work on policy issues, but I think there is some promise there, and we've seen some progress in different policies as a result of those work, that work. I could just add one thing. You know, we do a lot of work on sugary beverage taxes, um, which is near and dear to Philadelphia's heart, I think. And one of the things that, that we found is this question that arises over and over about substitution and, and about purchases outside of the urban area. And in that, in that setting, you know, we've had to reach out to those communities outside the cities that we haven't necessarily done before. And there is this need to harmonize policy, which I think um, is sort of driving uh, a little bit more outreach than we've seen in the past. Hi, I'm Gina Hayu from Drexel College of Computing and Informatics. 
Um, I wanted to ask specifically to Carrie's presentation on social isolation. And for me, coming from technology, obviously, the first thing I thought about is technology. And you had mentioned something about social media and how there's some controversies there. I would love to hear further about that and whether uh, the people that you studied, if they want technology, if they're given the opportunity to use it. Yeah, uh, great question. So there, there's a growing and really super interesting, I think, body of research on social media and isolation and how we use it to connect with one another or not. Um, and the takeaway from that, although with the caveat that it's we're still learning, there's still a lot to know, particularly for young people and what the lasting impact positive or negative will be on them and how they relate to one another. Um, but the upshot is that we know that social media can have a positive impact on one's sense of well-being and one's social connectedness if it's used sparingly and if it's used actively. And where we see it have negative impacts is if someone's just passively scrolling through a Facebook feed, not engaging. Um, I think it leads to a lot of FOMO. You're feeling like everybody else is living this wonderful, glamorous life, and you're not. Uh, we also know there are issues of online bullying and trolling. There are all sorts of problems uh, that can arise. But if it's used sparingly and to connect with people and as a facilitator to other meaningful interactions, so say you're using it to reconnect with someone and then you're getting together in person or having a phone call, um, then we see some positive health impacts there. Um, and the second part of your question, do people actually want it who don't have it now? Uh, yes. I, I think by and large, yes. There are in rural areas specifically, but I imagine in urban areas too, some people who purposefully want to live off the grid and that's what they want in life. Um, but a lot of people do want access for when they need it or want it to broadband internet and to technological devices, partly because that's the way our economy works today, which is not news to anyone in this room. Uh, but rural areas that are being left out of cell connectivity and broadband internet access are also being left out of our economic system and other ways that we connect with one another. Hi, I'm Nupur Chowdhury at the New York State Health Foundation. I actually lead a place-based initiative called Building Healthy Communities. Um, some of them are urban and some of them are, are rural uh, across the state. And, and I'm super interested in this conversation around super blocks. So, so one of the neighborhoods that we fund, Brownsville, Brooklyn, actually was redeveloped in the 1930s and 40s for public housing and the design of it was the establishment of super blocks in the neighborhood. And folks can trace the increase in violent crime in that neighborhood to the creation of the super blocks. And so I'm curious in your analysis whether or not you guys have done any, um, any studies or any thoughts around increasing uh, violent crime rates as a result of super blocks or have looked at other cities um, across the world and how super blocks have affected it uh, negatively. Um, no, crime is not included yet. Uh, as what I said, so far only three super blocks have been created. So we're collecting data on this and crime is also being collected. I mean, because it's an issue in, in Barcelona, although we don't have much crime. Uh, we collect all the data that... Um, I, I think partly it may also depend, you know, on the quality of the super blocks. I mean, it's, you know, you need to put something in there and, and there is some evidence, for example, now what you see in housing estates, etc. if there's more green around, there is actually less violence, less crime. I mean, it, it's documented even here. Um, Michelle has been working on it here in Philadelphia as well uh, for the greening, how it re reduces crime. So uh, I think there is some, some work done on that. But yeah, for the superblocks specifically, we haven't, um, have, uh, don't have any data. And we didn't use it in our health impact assessment because it wouldn't be based on any data. We try to use as much what we think is definitely happening, what, is, what we could model, and for that we didn't have any data. Um, I have another question about the superblocks. Uh, can you talk about sort of the approval slash public buy-in process? Was it easy for the community to sort of think about this new landscape change? Did they like it? Do you have to really convince them to do it? I mean, I, I'm assuming the idea came from the urban planning 
group in the government, but can you just talk about, is there a referendum required? How do they actually transition? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question, because, um, so it came actually from a different, an institute that works around, it's a sociologist called uh, Salvador Rueda, who came up with the idea, it's, it's more related to the original plan of Barcelona, what uh, Ildefonso Sada had for the city, you know, more green and uh, more space for people to walk around. Uh, so he built on that and he created the super blocks. Now, when the first one was introduced in the Pablo Now area, at once there was huge protests. Uh, people didn't want to have the super blocks. I mean, um, at that time, in the, there were everywhere on the window super blocks, uh, no, or super EAS, it's the Catalan name, no. And so there became a big protest uh, movement against it. Um, people felt that it was imposed on them and, you know, what are going to leave my car now? I mean, the question, you know, what is happening with my car? What is, you know, what is this? I can't walk, you know, at, and so there was at once this out, uh, outrage where people were going on about that. And also the, um, the city council didn't manage it well, so they didn't go into the community before and to do it. So with the s second one, they uh, were much more involved with the community, saying what was going to come. Also, they've gone away a little bit from the original super block idea, what I showed you like here, to not clearly define what is a super block, because people on the, on the edges of the super block, they're afraid they're going to have more cars. And so um, people are all happy to have fewer cars in their, on their street, but not possibly more. So now they don't clearly define what is exactly the border of the, of the block, but they leave it a bit open to do. And that's what I showed you, Sant Antonio, for example, what was here in the picture that I showed. It's a bit more open and people are much more accept, uh, are accepting it uh, at the moment. So it's been easier. And the city council is learning because I mean now a few more are planned so um, there is much more um, participation of, of the, the, the local stakeholders, uh, people get more used to it. Um, our study is what I said is coming out on Monday, hopefully the half argument will help as well to, to, to convince people that it's a good idea. Uh, people know we have a big problem in Barcelona with air pollution as well, we have a big problem with cars, so hopefully that will you know, it will get better. But it was not an easy process. And, you know, for me, it, initially, it was a surprise because I thought everyone would love it, and it was not the case. I mean, <laughs> but, yeah, people don't like change that much in, in general, but... Uh, this is actually a question I had for the previous panel, but I think it fits very well for this panel. Uh, I think uh, Anne showed a picture of the um, of the Baltimore area, and I'm, I'm I'm always obsessed with metropolitan areas. So instead of just counties or cities or all of these things, and I'm wondering, you know, this connection between the suburban and the urban, and when we just look at the city, at the county of the city, and we ignore what is right uh, around it, how do you think we can we can um, we can parse this out because governments tend to be fixed to counties. Now the region around the city, is, it's, it, that's, a, that's a tricky thing because it influences the city, but the city has no power over it. Anybody else want to answer that? Um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think it's a big issue. I mean, if, if I look at, you know, I talk about Barcelona, Barcelona city, it's 1.6 million. Actually, the metropolitan area is 3.5 million. And many of the problems that are being created in Barcelona, the high traffic density, is because people from the metropolitan area come to the city. Uh, in the metropolitan area, there are 40 different city councils. Um, they're starting to work together at the moment, but not sufficiently. And so that creates problems because, you know, Barcelona city doesn't want to have the cars, but how do people get in? I mean, that they can't, you know, you need to have more public transport, more cycling lanes or whatever, but it's very hard to achieve. I mean, and I think many cities around the world dealing with that because more cities growing together, different regions, villages, whatever, become together. But there's not this kind of good governance that you need to create one, one area and deal with things like transport um, or generally urban planning. I mean, that's, and I think that's what we see in many places nowadays. And um, unfortunately, that creates problems. The this governance system hasn't caught up with it. 
Yeah, and I think there's this whole idea that, um, you know, there's resource scarcity. So if I look at Baltimore City, Baltimore City is home rule. Um, they do not work with Baltimore County, which surrounds the Baltimore region. They're two separate jurisdictions entirely. There are some, you know, agreements with watershed management, but basically um, there's a lot of competition. Baltimore City has tried to impose taxes on commuters coming into the city because they're using the resources. So there's this very antagonistic relationship. This also is true in education. Um, because educational, so, but what we're seeing, and I think this is fascinating, and I feel like this kind of movement may build the case for creating a, you know, a larger jurisdictional area. The poverty rate in Baltimore County is growing at a much faster rate than Baltimore City. And it's because the city core is becoming more expensive to live in. And so now people are moving out to the county. And so we're seeing this povertyization happening in the suburban areas. And so now this, the county's having to recognize that they can't contain, you know, this is, we're not gonna be isolated from the city problems. They're, it's, they're, we're all big one, we're one area and we have multiple problems. And so that piece of it is definitely, there's still a lot of denial, but that piece of it where we are sharing common problems that are gonna need to be able to share some solutions, I think there's some hope there. And I see jurisdictions like Minneapolis, which is a city and a county. Hennepin County is part of, you know, the city. And we've had people come and do presentations to Baltimore about we need to be thinking of ourselves differently. And people on Baltimore are just not, don't want to change. But I think there is hope because we are, it, we cannot, these uh, issues are not bound by geography, right? This is not a political boundary issue. This is happening all over. And we've got to start recognizing that those solutions have to come from the same place. Just to mention, I think that's uh, true globally as well. So in low and middle income cities, you know, we went to Dar es Salaam to try to begin a road safety program there and met with the mayor because we always try to use the mayors as our entry point. And there are actually six mayors of Dar es Salaam. And each one, and the, sit, and the streets are actually divided. So half of a street belongs to one mayor and half belongs to another. So it can become extraordinarily complicated even within the city sometimes. Thank you very much for your presentations. I really enjoyed it. I have a question about how to frame the fight against air pollution. So now most, most of the people would agree that it's, air pollution is bad and you have to fight against that. But there's been some changes in some cities where they focus on new ways of transport, on transportation that might not be the best for health issues. For example, electric scooters. And that's that's a big issue because it's really easy in terms of political terms. You put like new scooters, new companies doing things, you are fighting against air pollution and you can see changes in some things in really short time. But in the end, that's not fighting against air pollution, it's the same way of transportation, it's replacing modes as walking or cycling. And how, in your experience, how, how it's a good way to frame the fight against air pollution for different things? It's a great question. I think, you know, if we want to focus on transportation, that's a, an easy thing, I think, to focus on. And you, and you hit a couple points. Um, I, I didn't mention it, but Barcelona has a lot of scooters, and there's a lot of air pollution from scooters, so I won't mention that like, very loud. Um, they're, they're, they're not as clean. They're not, they don't, they're not big enough to have the air pollution control that cars have. Um, in addition, diesels, uh, Switzerland, Italy, and I think Barcelona is up there in nearly 50%, or Spain is, is nearly 50% of their passenger vehicles are diesel. Here, we're a few percent, and, and those have very different emissions. And essentially, what it comes down to is, if you're burning something in your car on the street, you're making air pollution, so we need to figure out a way to have transportation, whether it be personal transportation, be electrified, or more public transportation, but reduce the on street level combustion of fuel, whether it be biodiesel, gasoline, whatever. But essentially electrifying your vehicle fleet moves the air pollution to where the electricity is generated. And if we can then clean up our electricity generation to not be burning things as well, then we have done a huge amount to reduce air pollution overall. So, I mean, electrify, move the air pollution outside of the areas where a lot of people live and you know, then clean up our electricity generation system. Yeah, I must say we need to be a bit careful with that. And I would use more a health arguments, you know, trying to get people out of the car and getting to cycle. 
not use electric scooters or even not uh, use electric cars because at the moment, electric cars are being very much promoted. Uh, the car manufacturers put an awful lot of money at the moment to produce uh, or to promote electric cars, to design them. That's why we're going to have them. I mean, if we want it or not, I mean, Volkswagen just uh, invested 30 billion euros into electric cars. So, I mean, they need to get their investment back, and so we're going to get them if we want them or not. The, the, you know, and there are problems with electric cars. I mean, very large environmental problems because, you know, they use batteries. Uh, the ingredients for the batteries, cobalt or whatever, I mean, at the moment, the way they're being extracted, where they come from, Congo or whatever, I mean, they're horrendous circumstances, to be honest. I mean, and, you know, they, they use other things. I mean, and there are many environmental problems related to that what are at the moment not being talked about. So I, for me, you know, an electric car is still a car. Um, it's more, much better to convince people to get out of your car. You know, you can't go to the gym, so uh, you don't normally have time, but just build uh, the gym into your commute to, to work. I mean, get your bicycle and cycle. And I think, uh, or walk, or get, you know, live a bit closer to your work if you can. And I think that's more the way to do it. I mean, um, and I hope that that catches on more than trying to change the technology uh, in this case. Thank you. And please join me in thanking the speakers.